cybersecurity? There's a ton of content out there, and if you don't know where to start, it can be overwhelming, even paralyzing. So let's fix that. Welcome to Simply Cyber, a community of tens of thousands of aspiring and active cybersecurity professionals focused on networking, knowledge sharing, and professional development. I'm Dr. Gerald Dozier, Chief Content Creator at Simply Cyber, inviting you to get the answers to your cybersecurity problems with hundreds of cybersecurity videos answering your frequently asked questions, interviewing industry experts, and live streaming daily cyber threat briefings hosted by me. Now get the stories and insights you won't find anywhere else. Hit subscribe now and dig into all the fresh content on the channel and in the community. Nothing should stop you from launching and leveling up your cybersecurity career today. All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the show. Today is Tuesday, November 28th, 2023. Welcome to episode number 503 of Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing. I am your host, Dr. Gerald Dozier. And over the next 45 minutes, me, you, Homo Glockman, Sharice Lamb, Cyber Hamburger, Tom Bishop, Zip Tablaw with the spicy wasp running around, Matt McDaniel, Space Tacos and the Flame and Donkey Crew, Darius Jurek, Rocker Laura Flores, my man with the coffee, Matt McDaniel, Carrie Chris Young, the Marine, and Mark Lester, our low country's own Mark Lester, coming in hot with the top cyber news stories of the day. And I'll be giving my expert opinion and analysis on each of those stories on what it means to you um, to drive operational risk for your organization if you are a practitioner and if you are a aspiring cybersecurity professional, whether you're already in IT, <clears throat> excuse me, looking to make a major uh, career pivot, or you're a 16-year-old in Discord server uh, looking to level up and really get into the industry as soon as possible, we got value for you. You will be asked in any cybersecurity job interview, how do you stay current on the industry? Believe me, you will be asked in any cybersecurity job interview, how do you stay current in the industry? Just to repeat that, the Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Brief podcast is a fantastic answer. It's not the only answer. I know this cup of tea isn't for everybody, but for those who it is, settle up, put your hands around it. It is a warm, delicious cup of tea. Maybe Darjeeling. I don't know. Maybe green. I don't want to. I don't want to subscribe to any type of tea flavors after the Royals in you know Royal Gate from yesterday. I do want to. Uh, not commit to anything really. Uh, but believe me, you're going to get value from the stream. Plus the networking over here is phenomenal. Look at James McQuiggan coming in hot with the super chat. Yep. Good morning, James McQuiggan coffee cup. Cheers to you, sir. Have a good day. Also, I hope everything is well in your world, James. I hope Thanksgiving was good. And I hope the holidays are right around the corner. Poll question for the community. If you do celebrate Christmas or Hanukkah or any uh, festivus, any type of celebration that requires setting up decorations was this last weekend the weekend you did it or did you punt and you'll be doing it next week let me know in chat we did it this past weekend myself uh in the family all right guys i want you to know that i do not prepare or research any of these stories in advance so i am coming in hot 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 Fashy. i am coming i'm riding low on a train bound for glory over here with the retro synthwave background in the back we are ready to rock. If you are here live with us, hashtag team live, like Carolyn Scott and Victor Agbana. Good to see you guys in check. Good morning. Each episode of the Daily Cyber Threat Briefing is worth half a CPE. So it stacks two and a half a week, 10 a month. Do yourself a favor. Just make it part of the standard workflow. Grab a screen cap of your name and chat. That's the reason why I have chat on screen. So you can screen cap it, put it in a file, and when you quarterly or annually file your CPEs, just you know select all, count the number of files, multiply it by 0.5, enter that in, dump it as an archive. You're off to the races. Now, I also want to say shout out and thanks to the stream sponsors who allow me to stand up here every morning and yell into this microphone while drinking this delicious cup of coffee. Hashtag Citadel uh, coffee cup. Oh my God, so good. Let me tell you about Barricade Cyber Solutions, all. 
Barricade Cyber Solutions is committed to helping businesses recover from cyber attacks and recover from the damage done. More importantly, cyber attacks can cause massive issues for businesses and send the dedicated, hardworking business owners into turmoil. Might be you. You might be the owner uh, of a small, medium, or large size business. You might be the CEO, president, director, whatever it is. Imagine, if you will, for a hot minute, payroll doesn't work anymore. Imagine for a hot minute, your manufacturing printing presses don't work anymore. Imagine for a minute, your computers of all your employees don't work anymore. That's basically how you kind of uh, reconcile what ransomware can do to your business. So go to barricadecyber.com, get connected with Eric Taylor, at least as an introduction, because they can help you mitigate the damage done by cyber incidents. Believe that, barricadecyber.com, links in the description below. Also, what's up, Panopsi? Hey there, Brandon Poole. Uh, in full advice, um, disclosure, I am a board advisor at Panopsi Security, but they're also a sponsor and I love their business. Get a partner who understands your cyber program and your business goals, more importantly. Brandon Poole and his team can come in in a fractional VC so project fashion, which basically means they come in for a few weeks, consult with you, and give you expert advice. You don't need to spend the next 10, 15 years learning how to be better at cybersecurity. You can just hire Panopsi for two week engagement and jump the line, if you will. They're going to give you all the information you need to get that low hanging, high risk reducing fruit, pick it off the tree, pick, 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 and then set you up for a multi year information security maturity uh, plan, which is dope. Absolutely. Hey, Valentino. I know a lot of people have been asking for the Panopsi emote. Uh, I appreciate that. All right, let's keep going here. And um, anti-siphon training, but more about them at the mid-roll per use. Uh, guys, I got two things to share with you uh, that kind of dropped into my lap last night. Um, also, by the way, I forgot. I said, what's up to Team Life? How dare I? How dare? This is what my eight-year-old says now. How dare you? How dare I leave out Team Replay? Hashtag Team Replay if you're watching on Replay. Love Team Replay. My Replay, pe Team Replay are my people. Um, love it, love it, love it. Love the comments, Team Replay. I know a lot of you just do hashtag Team Replay, uh, but I do see a lot of the comments coming on, coming in and the engagement from you all. So definitely appreciate that. It, it's a community, guys. We are a community. All right, before we get into the news uh, in the next... Um, 50 seconds here. I do want to take one hot minute and share this with you. This came across my feed yesterday. ACI Learning has this live webinar series. I've been a guest on it, but I wanted to tell you this is absolutely free. It is Thursday, November 30th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. So this does not conflict with my Gary Binder post-quantum talk on Thursday at 4.30. So you can do both. You can have your cake, Nick Barker, and eat it too. All right. All things cybersecurity with Bo Bullock. Listen, guys, Bo Bullock is the guy, his online handle is Daft Punk. He is a engineer. He's a pen tester. He's very good. He works at Black Hills InfoSec. He's got a shaved head and a big bushy red beard. And he's one of the brains behind Graph Runner, which is a phenomenal tool, which he's going to be coming on um, stream to talk about pretty soon. So if you're interested in learning from an expert in the industry, I'll drop a link in chat. Um, this is ACI learning. I know it's a big hot mess of a, of a link, but go check it out. It's going to be good. All right, guys. Now what I would like to ask you to do is get, get a cup of coffee or get your, uh, cup of tea or get your bourbon. If it's the evening or hell, I don't know. I'm not judging. You might be in an airport right now. Apparently 6am in an airport is, is it's okay. <laughs> what, what is the deal with like the social acceptability of drinking? If you're at an airport, I, I, it's fun. It's funny to me. And hey, I'm not I've had a beer at 9 a.m. at an airport, so I'm not casting stones here. It's just to me, it's like a funny wormhole of time. But wherever you are, wherever you're consuming this information, Professor Black Ops, what's up? Good to see you. Um, wherever you are, sit back and relax because we're about to consume the hot news uh, and let it wash over us in an awesome wave. I will see you all at the mid roll. From the CISO series, it's Cybersecurity Headlines. These are the Cybersecurity Headlines for Tuesday, November 28th, 2023. I'm Rich Straffolino. International AI Agreement. 
The international community didn't take a long Thanksgiving weekend. On November 26th, 18 countries, including the U.S., U.K., Germany, Estonia, Israel, and Australia, released an international agreement pushing for the private development of secure-by-design AI systems. While non-binding, the 20-page agreement provides general recommendations like monitoring AI systems for signs of abuse, vetting the software supply chain, feeding their infrastructure, and protecting underlying data sets. These guidelines do not address how AI data sets are composed or gathered. PA Water Utility. All right. All right. Um, I do not want to be dark and macabre and cynical here. Okay. So if you've been following AI, okay. Shall we play a game? If you've been following AI and the Sam Altman, open AI and the Q star stuff, which I'm not going to get into. Um, here is my take on this. First of all, yes, AI needs regulation definitively. Okay. So that's a hot take. This isn't really a cyber, excuse me. This isn't a cybersecurity story. And this happens from time to time with the Simply Cyber Daily Cyber Threat Briefing podcast. But you can't you can't go to a conference, you can't look at the news without AI sucking all the oxygen out of the room right now. Okay, so it's it's here. Let's let's deal with it. Now, 18 countries, I don't know which ones, but US, Britain, we have to assume NATO related countries, I guess. Uh, have agreed to AI secure by design. Obviously. Like uh, like come on. You are so dumb obviously secure by design like what kind of jack wagons like you know what let's bolt it on we haven't learned from the internet or the last 45 years of technology development so okay let's give them you know in a, a round of applause for for coming to that uh decision second of all 18 page document okay like who's who is bound by it it says it's a non-binding document so it's just a bunch of smart people laying down best practices and things that you should do here is what I'm, uh, here's why I'm cynical, okay? And I want to be, I want to be optimistic. I think of myself as a very positive person, okay? But check me out for a hot minute. The businesses that are making AI, like the, this isn't 1947. This isn't 1952. Governments are not the ones doing all of the research and development, this, this, the biggest brains are not working at RAND and SRI and NIST. The biggest brains are not locked into a, a booth in some nondescript building in DC. The biggest brains are making straight cash, homie. Straight cash, homie, for private sector businesses. We live in the technology gilded age. Meta, Amazon, Whatever Elon's enterprise is, if you want to call it that, like X and, and, and SpaceX and all these other things, right? Like Microsoft, Google, <laughs> Oracle, I suppose. Like th th they're the ones with the smartest people. Open AI, right? For-profit companies, yes, they're led by a board, but you know what they're motivated by? Money. It's all about capitalism. It's not about nationalism or patriotism or national identity. It's about individual straight cash, homie. So why am I saying all this? Here's my thing. These countries, oh, secure by design. But this doesn't apply to the work that open AI is doing. U.S. is not going to stick. They're not going to like ramrod their head into open AI's business operations and say, this is how you're going to do it now. Now, if they pass federal regulations and laws, sure, they can do that. But they move so slow that it's not going to happen. And if you look at the freaking progress that AI is making, where they're talking about super intelligence, Q star, um, you know, there's rumors floating about that the board fired Sam because, um, you know, basically the intel like the the chat GPT or open AI has is is developing like um sentient AI, right? So these these things are like ma majorly concerning. And by the way, if we learn thank you, Emmanuel, exactly. Uh and if we've learned one thing, again, one thing from the crypto markets, um it's that if, if you're in a country, like, dude, in 2023, everything's hyper-connected. If you live in a country, like, say, the United... Let's just say for a hot minute, the United States comes off the top rope and drops an elbow on open AI and says, 
moving forward, all, all things, everything, like the most invasive government oversight ever, all things need to come through the U.S. government. Open AI can just move to like Trinidad, Tobago or Caicos or Bermuda or Argentina or Antarctica. Like they can move anywhere where your rules don't apply here anymore. Do you understand? Like, it, like you're not confined anymore to geographic regions. Now they could say, oh, you can't sell your product in the United States. Okay. You think that the people who are in power in the United States, which by the way, are mostly business owners, aren't going to want to leverage AI for their business and making straight cash on me? Hell no. So I said this back in like, I don't know, April, May, the genie's out the bottle. The best thing you can do right now is hopefully slap a saddle on this sucker and ride the lightning because you're not going to contain this thing. The best you can hope is to coexist with it. All right. So that's what I got to say about that. Again, this isn't a cyber story. So you're just getting hot takes. Hit by cyber attack. The Municipal Water Authority of Aliquippa confirmed threat actors accessed a Unitronics vision system used in a booster station over the Thanksgiving weekend. The Iran-linked group Cyber Avengers took credit for the attack. This station monitors and regulates water pressure to two townships in Pennsylvania. Admin said the attack did not pose a risk to the water system. It's not clear if the threat actors exploited a vulnerability in the system or found an internet-exposed interface without any authentication. All right. Based on what I know, <laughs> uh, it was probably internet facing. Uh, could have been Citrix Bleed. Who knows? Uh, someone get Justin Gold on the phone. Another water utility company hit. Um, ew, so gross. Um, Catch me outside. How about that? Seriously. Uh, so, water municipality, these, the, okay, so a couple things. One, in the United States, critical infrastructure is broken into multiple kind of sectors. I, it's either 16 or 18. BSEC always jumps on my back and Justin Gold jumps on my back when I get it wrong. I think it's 18. Uh, but water is one of them. And we don't really think often about water as like a core critical infrastructure. But guess what? If you turn on your tap and then nothing comes out, if you flush your toilet and the bowl doesn't refill, if you try to get in the shower because you stink like three-day-old fish and there's no shower... You're really going to be uh, bothered by that instantly. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, um, if I'm not mistaken, the human a human can go longer without food than without water, if I'm not mistaken. So water is wicked important, okay? Which is, by the way, why all these like charities that deal with third world countries that don't have access to clean water is a thing. That's why if you look at what's going on in Gaza right now, uh, again, not to get hyper-political and talk about Israel um, um, Hamas and Gaza and everything, but water and access to water is a, it's a, it, it's not really, a, it, that's one of the key things they don't have access to in Gaza right now, which is part of the reason that it, it's, it's being deemed a humanitarian crisis. So all that is just to emphasize that in the United States, you know, <laughs> we get to go to a convenience store and be like, ew, like Poland spring. Ugh, where's my Fiji at? And in other in other worlds, I mean, it's like, oh, like I only have to boil this for 30 minutes. Oh, I want the water that I only have to boil for 20. All right. So anyways, this is a hack. Uh, Iran linked activist group called Cyber Avengers. Um, typically, you would think Iran. OK, this might be geopolitically related. Um, I don't I don't know. I haven't heard of Cyber Avengers before. I do give them a shout out for the leet speak. Uh, obviously, I don't know who deemed that either security researchers or them themselves. This doesn't sound like that incredible a hack. Um, th there was an HMI left exposed to the internet without authentication. So it says low skilled threat actors. They're kind of taking a crap on these on these hackers on this hacktivist group. Basically, somebody went on showed and, and found an HMI. That's the TLDR. This is not really about the hacker. This is more about information security at a water treatment plant. Here's, here's what you need to know. One, whether you work in water or you work in any business that you're responsible for information security that has industrial control or operational technology. So I'm looking at energy, um, HVAC, water, dams, um, manufacturing, these type of places. An HMI is a human... Uh, machine interface, right? It's like a console to make things happen, right? With a cyber physical system. 
It should never be facing the internet. This all day long, this is a misconfiguration. And by the way, a lot of people crap on, okay, so it's 16 sectors of critical infrastructure. Here's the deal. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a hot, a hot take, okay? Here is the reality, okay? And we don't get to talk about this very often. <laughs> so I'll try to make it as exciting as possible. Change management, okay? People hate change management. There's an entire NIST control family, CM dash number number, okay? Change control, change management is important. But Jerry, I hate, I, I'm an innovator. I'm a, I'm a fast mover. I'm a one man shop. Oh, I, got, I don't got time for your change management. Here is what happens, okay? When you don't use change management, I guarantee you some engineer like either replaced a piece of technology and stood up the new one, which was the HMI and proved and, and tested it and said, yes, packets are flowing. Yes, I can change. I can lift the arm or I can, you know, push chemicals in or whatever the heck this HMI does. Thumbs up going to get tacos. Okay. Like, like reporting to the boss, we win. And in reality, you have to have checks to make sure that it's not internet facing change management would have given, I guarantee you this thing go through change management. When you do change management, here's how it works. You have a board called the CAB, the change approval board or configuration approval board, whatever you want to do. And the deal is someone says, hey, on Tuesday, I'm going to replace this deprecated old POS HMI device with this new fangled one over here. Why? Because last week on the Daily Cyber Threat Briefing, Jerry was losing his mind about legacy technology and we've got the funding to, to replace it. Okay, cool. Hey, um, the network engineers in the room at the board, because usually IT's at the board, uh, the change control board, help desk is there, the business is there, right? The key stakeholders are there for what? Not to approve or disapprove, but more to have freaking visibility that these changes are happening. And then you say, the network guy, BSEC, is sitting at the table. He looks up from his phone because he's trying to get Cyber Monday deals, right? And he's like, wait a minute, you're putting some, you're swapping it on the internet, uh, uh, on the network? Okay, cool. Do you need an IP address? Are you going to use the same IP? I don't know. I hadn't thought about that. I was just going to plug it into an open jack. <sighs> all right. All right. Cool. We're not going to do that. What we're going to do is either let me know when you're going to do it and I'll swap the IP and make sure it's in the correct VLAN or... We'll put it in, it'll dynamically get a new IP, which would be ridiculous to do with an HMI, but we'll just go with it, okay? We'll get a new one, and then I'll make sure that it's in the correct VLAN, or I'll make sure that it gets on the right network segment, or I'll make sure that it's not internet facing, or I'll make sure that I use Shodan to scan it, or I'll make sure to use a vulnerability scanner and look at it. I'll make sure to do anything other than let you plug it into the internet, pal. This is what change approval is, and it gets crapped on because it's seen as a bloated bureaucratic time sink. And in reality, it stops issues like this. Way to go, authority of Aliquippa in Pennsylvania for making the news. All right. Ukraine claims cyber attack against Russian aviation. The Ukrainian Defense Intelligence Agency claimed his success. All right. So CAB is change advisory board, not change uh, approval board. Guys, I. Listen, I've been on cabs, I've run cabs, I've built cabs. I forget the acronym. Let me just tell you guys really quickly. When you use acronyms all the time in the industry, remembering what they stand for, sometimes you make a mistake. Like CVEs yesterday, I got my back jumped on about CVEs, uh, cabs, um, change advisory board, BSEC looking to replace me as an information security professional and as a uh, live streamer up here based on my inability to get acronyms right. But it is important because if I'm up here saying an acronym and you go forward saying it and it's not correct, I don't want you to look dumb because I'm looking dumb up here. All right, so there it is. Thank you and let's keep going. Fully carried out an attack against Rosa Vyatsia, the Russian Civil Aviation Agency. The agency claimed it obtained a large volume of confidential documents in the action going back 18 months. While cyber operations have been a hallmark of the war in Ukraine since Russia invaded the country, this marks the first time the Ukrainian government has officially taken credit for an attack. The agency claims the obtained data shows continued sanctions on Russian civil aviation industry has led to a significant rise in aircraft accidents and malfunctions that put the entire sector at risk. All right. Well, that's not good. Um, 
Okay, so <clears throat> basically, here's the deal. Um, Ukraine at this point is like, what else? Like, <laughs> for a while, they were, you know, saying we weren't hacking Russia, but why wouldn't they? Honestly, they're in a military conflict with them. They are fighting for their lives. Russia invaded their their land, but whatever. Ru Ukraine's claiming it, um, and they hacked Russian aviation agency. It's important to note again, aviation. Uh, very important area. It falls under transportation, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and they got, you know, they, they're not impacting. Here's the important thing. They're not impacting flight ops. They're not inside of air traffic control. They're not. This isn't the, the plot to Die Hard 2, where they're like, you know, changing the altimeter inside of a, a flying plane. So it drives into the uh, runway. OK, all they did was hack and get some intel from Russian aviation agency. And honestly, it sounds more like um, Gonzo reporting than it sounds like uh, cyber ops because they hacked, got the intel and then released it. And all it really revealed was that um, because of the degradation and sanctions affecting Russia right now, it's it, their aviation industry is become very unsafe. It sounds like there's a higher probability of air accidents or aviation related accidents. Obviously you can have an accident on the runway itself. Um, so these sanctions, it's not just about straight cash, homie, right? Straight cash, homie. It's not just about um, selling, you know, flights and, and uh, gas, you know, jet fuel and stuff like that. This is having profound impact on human lives uh, being lost uh, because of, you know, well, I actually, it didn't say that people are dying. So I shouldn't, I shouldn't uh, state that. But anyways, um, it just goes to show you, dude, the sanctions on Russia. It's not just about Starbucks and McDonald's pulling out like they did in the first month of the war. Uh, this is very much um, uh, impacting all sorts of things downstream. I, I this this particular article looks really good um, as far as like a lot of intel and information. I'm going to link it in chat right now. If you'd like to read a little bit more about it from a cyber practitioner day to day. This information is more macro level. Um, it's on the board, if you will. And we should be mindful of these type of activities. If you work in the United States, you should be mindful of these opportunity, uh, these uh, situations, but you're not like changing the way that you're securing your business. You're not pivoting. You're not, um, you know, updating your threat models based on this. This is just more geopolitical macro environment stuff to be mindful of. Uh, but all they did, you know, they just hacked in and, you know, they may have gotten some creds from somebody through phishing or whatever and, 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 you know, whatever, by the way, it's important to note that this says this, but just again, being a little bit of a cynic here, let me, let me do a, um, tinfoil hat, just being a little bit of a cynic, this could happen, but it's totally not unrealistic in my mind that, you know, I don't know, the United States hacked into Russian aviation agency and then just passed the intel and how they achieved the mission to Ukraine and then Ukraine claims it, right? Uh, again, I'm not saying, like Ukraine obviously has skilled cybersecurity practitioners. Before the war, there was a subset of Rus ransomware threat actors operating out of Ukraine. So let's not be uh, naive here, but I'm just saying Ukraine claims it, but that doesn't necessarily mean they did it. Uh, it's just good pub, right? So just, I don't know. That's a hot take. Alf V hits the Fortune 500. Yesterday on the show, we mentioned Fidelity National Financial disclosed a cyber attack to the SEC earlier this month. Subsequently, the Alf V ransomware group took credit for the attack. No word on what specifically the group accessed, with Fidelity only saying it accessed certain company systems and acquired certain credentials. The group also took credit for an attack on the healthcare company Henry Shine, resulting in the company taking down some apps and its e-commerce platform. This marks the second attack by the group against that company in a little over a month, initially hitting it back on October 15th. It claims it's stolen over 35 terabytes of sensitive data. All right. So um, I've said it before. Um, I, no one asked me about this, but I have like tiers. T I E R S tears, like different levels, not cr tears like crying tears. Uh, although Royal Gate almost brought me to the verge of tears. J J K J K. <laughs> Notorious ransomware gang Alfie. So Alfie, if I'm not mistaken, they're the same. Um, 
you know, deplorable miscreants that actually uh, narked out a company to the SEC for not disclosing a data breach the other day. They are a tier one ransomware threat actor. They are tier one. Lockbit is tier one. Uh, there's a whole bunch of tier twos uh, in there, but tier one meaning they're the best. Oh, uh, Joel Belton with gifted sub. There we go. Um, thanks, Joel Belton. Did we just become best friends? Yep. And uh, just so everyone knows, there is a link um, that if you want to know how to accept uh, gifted subs, there's a link you can click on. I, I've got to pull it. I, I put it in mod chat the other day, but I, I got to, I got to make it a bot thing. Um, anyways, so they hit Fidelity National Bank. Two interesting things here. One, this just oh, Kathy Chambers, Kathy Chambers in the house. Way to go, Kathy. Hello. All right. Hey. So here's what I said the other day. Um, if you don't know, Fortune 500 companies are, you know, the 500 like healthiest companies on the publicly traded New York Stock Exchange. Secondly, um, financial companies are usually big bucks and they usually invest heavily in information security to the point where, as far as I know, I have only seen um, financial services companies hire internal Red team testers, big tech companies do it as well, right? Like Amazon and Meta have red teams, but big tech and financials, right? And because it's because they want to protect the the money, right? That's where the money is. So for Black uh, Alfie, aka Black Cat, to get into Fidelity National and launch a ransomware attack is pretty impressive, frankly. Um, let's see, I'm. Um, so they're upset because uh, the financial company hired incident responders to deal with the incident. People like Barricade Cyber Solutions, who regularly deals with uh, ransomware threat actors. Um, Eric Taylor could do a, a live stream on just dealing with those. They hired Google's Mandian. Important to note, in the world of incident response, Google's Mandian is the 800-pound gorilla in the room. If you're a Fortune 500 company, you probably have Mandian on retainer. Uh, Google purchased Mandiant last year for, I don't know, untold billions of dollars. But basically, Mandiant is um, the hammer in the in the realm of incident response. They're not the only one, but they're the biggest one. Um, it doesn't, there's no more information in here about what they did. I think we only found out about it because um, Alf, uh, Bla Alfie Black Cat published that they uh, are pissed that they hired incident responders. Um uh, the final thing I'll say here is, ooh, Kevin Beaumont, aka Gossy the Dog, a must follow on Twitter, says that Fidelity National actually had tools exposed vulnerable to Citrix bleed up until uh, recent weeks. So a couple things here. One, it's important to note, because I'm not going to crap on a Fortune 500 company without prefacing it by saying large, large companies often have large, large attack surface, right? When we think about um, a business, right? When we think of a business, we're like, oh, we stand up a couple things or, oh, it's that building down the street, right? It's very easy to kind of put your arms around and be like, I get it. A Fortune 500 company that maybe has done mergers and acquisitions and has subsidiaries and all these other things, like you are this like hot mess express yard sale of businesses um, and you know, when you acquire someone, they have IT staff. Do you lay them off? Do you integrate? Do you do knowledge share? Like it's it's a slow moving um, cruise ship uh, when you're doing all these things. And because of that, you could have something like Citrix, right? Like when they say Citrix bleed was vulnerable uh, vulnerable to Citrix bleed, right? Fidelity in itself could have been hot to trot and ready to go and a thousand information security professionals, but some company that they bought last year that has a um, VPN connection into the home um, uh, local area, or not local area, but the internal network, um, or um, like b basically a VPN connection or some type of uh, connection back could have had Citrix and they could not have known about it. They could have said, okay, local IT, you're responsible for that. And local IT is like corporate, you're responsible for that. And the finger pointing goes like that. And these things happen. So I'm not going to crap on them for not having it together. They should have had it together, especially with something as hot as Citrix Bleed. That Hansel's so hot right now. Because Citrix Bleed is so hot right now. But seriously, um, it's not good. And 
I do. I will say this. I do appreciate that Alfie is not getting their money. Um, thank you. Alfie's not getting their money and they're all, uh, butthurt about it. Sorry, Kennedy, kind of. Um, they're all butthurt about it because, um, it looks like they're not going to get paid. Way to go. Uh, Fidelity National Financials for calling in law enforcement. Regulators! Mount up. And right, now get a to the mid -roll. sponsor, SpyCloud. Our sponsor today, SpyCloud, wants us to pay attention to a ransomware precursor that's not being talked about enough, InfoStealer malware. If you think you're covered by endpoint protection and antivirus solutions, think again. The SpyCloud team discovered that the presence of InfoStealers, including Raccoon, Vidar, and Redline on machines accessing work applications may indicate a likely future ransomware attack. They believe the first step in thwarting ransomware lies in knowing the data criminals have stolen from malware-infected systems and remediating it quickly. Get SpyCloud's new research and check your malware exposure at spycloud.com slash CISO. All right, this could be the end of Simple Minds. I got a copyright strike yesterday on yesterday's video for this one. We're going to play it today, but we might have to find some type of uh, interpreted version of this song. Uh, but it is the mid-roll. This is calm and let's do it. Hey, 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 yeet. yeet. All right, guys. I want to say thank you all so very much for being here. You guys are wonderful. Love it, love it, love it. Hey, Migdalia, it's been a minute. Good to see you. Uh, guys, I want to say thank you to you. If you, how many people we got? 438, love it. If you, one of you 438 is getting value from the stream, if you show up on the regular, if it's your first time, ask yourself, is this good? Is this worth my time? Am I having fun? Am I getting value, right? Am I learning from other people? Is Jerry spitting, whatever. If you're getting value, whether it's entertainment or educational, do me a favor. Do the Simply Cyber community a favor. Please hit the like button on YouTube. It basically is a technique to hack the YouTube algorithm because you like cybersecurity. You search for cybersecurity on YouTube. And if you like this, YouTube's going to be like, huh, other people who search for cybersecurity probably would like this show too. And that's how we grow the community. So please pay it forward. Thank you, uh, Z Zatalpa, Zatalpa, thank you. Uh, also, by the way, I forgot to mention this uh, earlier. Thank you all. You guys are so nice. Uh, guys, um, if, um, if it's your first time on the show today, please hashtag first timer in chat. I forgot to say it at the beginning. We love welcoming our first timer, so please hashtag first timer in chat. Um, I want to say shout out to Anti-Siphon Training, guys. Anti-Siphon Training, they are disrupting the traditional training industry by providing high-quality, cutting-edge education to everyone, regardless of their financial position. They give their students the skills, labs, hands-on practical, and they do it, some of their training, for absolutely zero dollars. It's This isn't a trick. This isn't this isn't some type of, like, you know, crafty, like, you get the first lesson free, and then they start uh, gouging you. You just sign up and take the courses. So there's no financial obstacle in your way. It's really a question of, do you want this to be a priority in your life? Yes or no? Go to training. Go to the link in the description. Go to training. Go to pay what you can training and check it out. End of January, John Strands Active Defense and Cyber Deception, a class I've taken and I have a full review on the Simply Cyber YouTube channel if you'd like to check it out. Excellent class, excellent instructor. And then right on the heels of that is SOC Core Skills with John Strand. You could take 32 hours of high-end training for $0. Speaking of, uh, thank you, Anti-Siphon. Speaking of Anti-Siphon, uh, they're with Black Hills Information Security, which one of their uh, staff members who also teaches for Anti-Siphon is Bo Bullock. Bo Bullock... Um, very, very advanced uh, penetration tester, author, co-author of Graph Runner, a, a major tool that's disrupting Office 365 penetration testing, is going to be interviewed live this Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern with ACI Learning. I'll drop a link again in chat. Go check it out. I, it's on my schedule. So if you guys want to high five and jaw jack and chat during Bo's uh, talk, I will be there. Um, come check it out. All right, we got the Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Keith Ferguson, my man, 
Keith Ferguson in chat. Keith, tag somebody. I want you to know, guys, if you want to level up your LinkedIn uh, network and really make it powerful, I'm telling you, networking is so valuable. Do the following. Keith Ferguson is going to tag somebody. But for everybody else, go on LinkedIn, step one. Step two, search for this hashtag, hashtag Simply Cyber Community Challenge. Step three, find a post, like find, um, excuse me, Keith Ferguson's post. Connect with Keith Ferguson. Comment on Keith Ferguson's post. Connect with the people in the comments. Because you're a person in the comments, the next person coming through the workflow is gonna connect with you. In two weeks time, five minutes a day, two weeks time, your network is going to explode and it's going to be massive value. If Keith could tag somebody, I would pretty much appreciate it. If you got any questions, uh, ask Chad. I'm telling you, the Simply Cyber Community Challenge can change your professional life. If, if you're trying to pivot into cybersecurity, definitely take advantage of this. It costs zero dollars, just like the other things here. It's all about value. Pass the baton. All right, guys, really quickly, it is Tidbits Tuesday. Every single uh, Tuesday, I share a little bit about myself. On Monday, uh, apparently yesterday, I shared about my feeling about the Royals. Uh, so that was a bonus Tidbits Tuesday. But just for the sake of time, let me just share this really quickly, guys. Um, I don't know how you guys feel about this, but I hate, <laughs> I hate fruit with seeds. I don't know if anyone else feels this way, okay? And I'm probably dispro disproportionately angry about it, but like olives, pitted olives, oranges with seeds, cherries with seeds, get out of here. You know what I don't wanna do? Work, like to eat, like I get it. I, I'll, I'll chew my food, okay? I'm willing to put that level of effort in, but like I wanna pop food in, right? I don't want like to crack a tooth. I don't want to be, I want to watch the game. I don't want to focus on like, oh, I've got to like basically peel this cherry inside my mouth and then spit a pit out, which is unbecoming, by the way, when you're like, ugh, ugh, ugh. okay, I, I, I'm i okay with sunflower seeds, maybe, but but pitted, pitted anything, especially oranges. If an orange has a seed in it, I yeet it into the trash. <laughs> All right. All right, so I'm getting I'm getting a lot of uh, shade here. Um, next level laziness, sinfulness. Alana Boyajian is on my team here. Grapes with seeds are the worst. I know, Carrie, but you can't take the seed. What are you gonna, like gonna cut? A, if you try to cut a grape and remove the seed, you basically mangled the grape, right? I don't know. I don't know. This. I guess I wanted to share these things just to see if you're with me or. If you're not with me, again, the Simply Cyber community is about inclusion. So we can agree to disagree on certain things, but we do have an open, safe community for open discourse. But yeah, don't don't try to serve me something with seeds. No, no, no. Thanks, BSEC. BSEC's got my back. All right. And before we get in back into the news, it says like Magdalia's got a interview today. So Magdalia. Straight up crush it. Let's go back to the news. Cyber attack hit Slovenian power company. The power provider HSE disclosed it experienced a ransomware attack that saw encrypted files accessed. The attack did not disrupt power production. HSE provides about 60% of domestic power production in Slovenia. The country's information security officer said IT systems and files remain encrypted as a result of the attack. Local media attributed the attack to the Resida ransomware organization, but this remains unconfirmed. All right, looks like Ashiana Ishmael has the baton. Thank you, Ashiana. All right, guys. Um, sunflower seeds are an exception. I, I like sunflower seeds. All right, so hey, Slovenia's largest power provider hit. Here's the TLDR from this one. One. The IT operations were hit a lot of times while OT and industrial control systems, the things that produce power, the things that transmit power, the uh, substations, those things that run on operational technology, not IT, are typically, while they do have IT integrations, they're typically separated in some capacity. Um, you can jump from IT into OT, but typically like just straight up kind of... Um, a threat actor doing uh, lateral movement and stuff like that. Um, we'll only see IT stuff and, and maybe not get into the OT. So the fact that they're hit by a ransomware, the Recita uh, ransomware group, 
which by the way, I think Resida is a, a new fork of uh, Revil. Are they Ukrainian based? Or... I don't know. I, I'm going to have to do some research on this one. But R- Resida is coming up as kind of a big, a bigger deal. Like they're moving up in the tier ranks. Uh, but th- their ability to deliver power to their customer base is fine. Guys, you got to remember, it's late November. It's winter. Slovenia, as far as I know, what, like it's cold there, right? Like, let, let me, like, what's the temperature in Slovenia right now? Anybody? Right now, it's 36 degrees in Slovenia. All right. It's, it's, it's going to be snowing on Thursday. Okay, I'm not making this up. This is real intel right now. So if you turn off the power, you could freeze people. Pipes could burst. People could lose access to water. Going back to my diatribe about water and the issues with water and how important it is. So the good news is people continue to have um, power. Uh, Let's hope that um, this HSE group uh, has been doing tabletop exercises. Let's hope they've been regularly following um, the simply cyber daily cyber threat briefing <laughs> and let's go. The new blockchain for funding militants. Reuters profiled the use of the crypto network Tron for funding militant groups, particularly by Iran. The Tron blockchain is dominant in transactions with the tether stable coin offering advantages over Bitcoin. It's quicker, has lower fees, and it's relatively stable. An analysis by the publication found that Israel's National Bureau of Counter-Terror Financing froze 143 Tron wallets over the last 30 months that it believed were funding severe terror crime. Since 2018, Iranian firms used Tron for over $8 billion in transactions, largely as a way around U.S. sanctions. All right. So a couple of things here. One, um, <laughs> it makes me think of... Um, Dave Chappelle's character Detron, uh, just that's a bit of a deep cut. But if if you're in chat, whether you're young or old, if you miss Chappelle's show, <laughs> it is a treasure trove of entertainment. Um, so is is um, Iranian militants okay? Uh, hold on, hold on. Did I I I messed this up. Hold on. Hold on. How is this? So this is the story is kind of weird. Okay, hold on. So a new front emerged in Israel's fight against militant finance. Okay, okay. So I was right. So um, Hamas or Hezbollah, um, they are using crypto and basically um, Tron crypto in order to fund militant um, action against Israel. Okay, so this is... um, adversaries uh fighting israel okay so hamas or hezbollah i i thought they mentioned iran but anyways um and it's it says tron's overtaken bitcoin as the largest crypto and blockchain out there again tron when they say the largest i'm sure they're talking about transactions not about value okay and they're saying that tron's really popular because it's faster um, one key thing, and I'll share a link with you in a second. One key thing you got to understand, if you read the blockchain white paper, the Satoshi white paper, even at its maximum, blockchain or Bitcoin can only handle about five to seven transactions a second. Okay. And to put that in perspective, Visa and MasterCard handle like 250,000 transactions a second or something like that. Right. Or definitely way more than five to seven a second, like tens of thousands. Okay. so. Bitcoin and in, in the whole way it approaches is not scalable as a replacement for USD, right? Which is another whole problem with uh, crypto as a um, currency. Now, they're saying Tron, which uses Terra. Um, I'm not going to get into all this crypto stuff, by the way. I'm a crypto evangelist. I love it, love it, love it. Right. I'm not going to get into all of it, but just it does move faster than blo- Bitcoin. Um, but here's the thing. They're using Tron to fund Israel militant. Here is my question for you. Simple question. Show me, where are you buying bullets or tanks or armor or like paying mercenaries or buying shoes or buying band-aids or buying food or buying tents? Where are you buying this 
on with Tron. Tron is a cur- a cryptocurrency. Many of you probably, I mean, I shouldn't say many of you, but I only heard about it last week. I don't know how many of you have heard of Tron. I'm sure all of you have heard of Bitcoin, but Tron, who the hell, sorry, Kennedy, who the heck is accepting Tron right now? Unless it's speculative marketing where it's like, hi, I'm whatever. I'm Jerry's tents emporium and I sell tents and AK-47s. Like I take Tron. And I, you know, I, I, at a huge markup. So if one Tron is worth one US dollar, this tent is $10,000. Like that's the only feasible or 10,000 Trons. Like that's the only feasible way I can see this happening. So, you know, good on you. Obviously terrorists and criminals are using cryptocurrency to subvert sanctions, to subvert uh, regulations, to subvert, you know, um, visibility in order to, for uh, where cash is flowing, this and that. But dude, do you really think that first world powers are oblivious to the way money is moving? No, not at all. So we'll see. It's not good for Israel, obviously, but I don't understand where this is going. Pursuit of Bliss has heard of Tron. Let's just check this out. Tron, current crypto, um, I don't know, um, chart, I guess. I mean, what are we looking for here? One Tron is chain is trading at 10 cents. Okay. And just looking at the one month, six month, you know, again, this, this show is definitely in no way financial advice. Absolutely. Don't take any financial decision based on anything I say, but Tron is trending upwards. It was worth seven cents on August 17th and now it's worth 10 cents. So, you know, basically kind of a 50% rise, you know, if you're into speculative marketing. If you're into playing casino games, there you go. But I mean, whatever. I just... Bah. Amazon announces a familiar thin client. Amazon announced a new $195 thin client for enterprise customers. It looks familiar using hardware virtually identical to its consumer Fire TV Cube device, although it's using a new software stack. According to Amazon's director of product and user computing at AWS, Melissa Stein, this approach let Amazon offer a lower price point rather than developing new hardware. The new thin client will let customers access virtual desktop environments based on its AWS end user computing services with no data stored on the device. All right, two things. One, really quickly, Brent, whoops, Brent B, um, Brent B. Uh, with the joke here, uh, Brent B said, you could say that whoever takes Tron payments is off the grid. <laughs> Very nice, Brent. Don't see yourself out. Just do a hot lap around the room and come on back to your chair because I think that joke is funny. All right, so check it out really quickly. Amazon selling thin clients. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Guys, back in the day, it used to be dumb terminals and mainframes. We've come a long way. I'm not saying that the cloud is a mainframe, but basically this is a thin client with no data stored on it. Um, and I bet you anything that we are going to see a, they've had thin clients in VDI. Uh, I've seen VDI is a virtual desktop interface. If I get my acronyms right, but basically, um, we've had thin clients for the last couple of years that are looking to take on um, you know, use the cloud as the back end, which by the way, makes it really easy to manage. It makes it easy to update. It makes it easy to, when you like fire somebody, there's no data on their machine. It, it makes it easy to do, um, uh, uh, data loss prevention. There's a lot of, be- it, it costs less money. Uh, there's a lot of benefits to doing, um, thing clients, frankly, even during the pandemic, like when it was wicked hard to get new technology, like you couldn't order uh, laptops for life cycle refresh. Um, this, you know, I mean, obviously they'd have to have the thin clients, but this is interesting. We'll see. I, I, I'm not sure how I feel about $195 for the thin client. I know this sounds ridiculous. I know this sounds ridiculous, but I think this is too expensive. I again, I'm, I don't research these stories, so I'd have to look into like what this gets you, but considering it's basically a terminal, uh, that interfaces with Amazon, this seems expensive. By the way, let me point out. This is just hardware. You, there is zero question in my mind. Great cash, homie. There's zero question in my mind that you have to pay a monthly fee or you have to pay a subscription fee for all the uh, endpoints that you stand up, right? So let's say you have a business with 10 people. 
there's $2,000 for thin clients, but then look forward to, I don't know, $1,000 a month for Windows operating system or $2,000 a month plus, all right, so there's your endpoint um, operating systems plus licenses. Now go ahead and enjoy paying for storage because you're gonna have to store all these things. Then go ahead and make sure that you're hyper-connected because if you lose internet connection, you have zero business continuity plan, I would assume, since nothing is kept local. Um, so this is definitely not something that you just, <laughs> first, I'm sorry, but here's where I'm gonna, um, throw a little shade without really thinking about what I'm saying and see if I get blown up again. This whole, this whole week is kind of like me saying things and then upsetting people, but CFOs just like B O excuse me, just like BYOD was the hotness, uh, and still kind of is with CFOs around, uh, like, Ooh, we're saving money. And also, um, not really thinking about the repercussions from a security perspective. This right here, CFOs are going to be like, Hold on, CIO, Chief Information Officer. You're telling me that you want a budget for forty thousand dollars to buy, you know, whatever, two hundred new laptops. I saw this Amazon thing on Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing because CFOs, LOL, don't really come here. But but CFOs are like, I saw this two hundred dollar laptop on Amazon. Buy two hundred of those, and let's take the savings and and you know report you know profit to the shareholders or whatever. And you got to be like, oh, no, dude, it's way more expensive than that. And we're taking on additional risk, my friend. So, um, and the CFO is like, denied. Like, Pfft. so what I would say is, this is definitely worth considering. As a security practitioner, you may like, for, you know, like for me, what I would recommend is at least familiarize yourself with what this is and what the business model looks like, because I could easily see like, um, um, like K through 12, right? Jesse Johnson, K through 12. There's a lot of benefit here from a security uh, position, lots of benefit. Okay. But you've got to be mindful. There's a lot of costs. Ask anybody who has Splunk for their SIM solution. Ask anyone that's running Sentinel and actually has it set up correctly. The fees, they come, and when they're there, buddy. Great cash, homie. Ooh, boy. Going back to the CFO to ask for additional money or else. Dude, can you imagine for a second? You get budget for like, I don't know, $100,000. And in um, you know July or August of the fiscal year, you still got three or four months left in the calendar year. And you're like, hey, Amazon's going to shut off everybody's computer unless we uh, come up with some money. And that's what it is, dude. Like, if you don't pay your monthly fee, they just shut you off. That's one of the downsides, if you will, quote unquote downsides of SaaS providers. They'll just shut you off and you're screwed. And if your entire workforce doesn't have a computer, ew, you got some big problems, my friend. Users reporting data loss on Google Drive. We got to hurry Numerous up, though, because I'm almost out of issue time. On Google support forums, indicating that some instance of the cloud storage service reverted to a snapshot from April and May 2023. As a result, many users report data loss and changes to folder structures. Activity logs do not indicate any changes as a result of user error. Some users reported success restoring data from offline caches, but there seems to be no workaround for recovering data in the cloud, at least so far. It's not clear how many users this has impacted. No word from Google officially confirming the issue. Oh man, this sucks. This sucks. Um, again, business continuity, guys. Business continuity all day long. Listen, I'm going to be quick about this. If you use Google Workspaces, if you use Google for personal stuff, Google One, if you pay for Google you know, One, which is basically like their um, cloud-based hard drive, uh, I do. I have all of my family photos, um, for, you know, years and years of family photos up in Google. If like, even though they're wicked solid and they're a fortune three company, this is an example of a problem. If you had some type of like intellectual property or research or something that you lost because they did this, you really have no repercussion. Like good luck litigating the hell out of this one. They'll send you into litigation. Um, you know, wormhole and you'll, you'll come back out in like 2027 without any money and still without your data. So be mindful of this. I personally offload all the photos to an external hard drive about, you know, I don't know, once a year, 
Um, I probably should be better about that. But my point is, if you don't control the infrastructure, even if you control the infrastructure, you could have a hard drive fail, which is why you do raid hard drives. Good cloud is not bulletproof, guys. And it's a little uh, disingenuous to say it's just a hard drive. It's just somebody else's computer out on the internet. It's a little disingenuous because it's more than that. But what I'm saying is this crap happens. So if you have sense, do, dude, do a data classification exercise. Do a data sensitivity exercise. Say it straight up. Listen, if we lost access to all the data in Google today and we lost it forever, what is the impact to us? That's how you do it. impact analysis. You ask that question and then you work through it with the business. Oh, it, wouldn't, it would suck, obviously, but it wouldn't end anything. Or, oh my God, we keep all of our intellectual property blueprints, everything up in there. We've got it encrypted because you told us to encrypt it. But if we lost it, it doesn't matter if it's encrypted. It's just no longer there. We would be screwed. The business would close. Jesus. Well, thanks for letting me know, Cliff. Maybe we should take a copy of that, stick it on a hard drive and throw it in a vault in the CEO's you know, bathroom or, you know, or, or office or wherever. I don't care. But you need duplicate copies of things that are important or sensitive. Period. The cloud is not bulletproof or invincible. You may even want to um, bookmark this story. I don't know if you need it right now, but this could be useful if you're trying to make a case for like uh, alternative on-prem solution or when you're doing any type of like business continuity planning. Uh, Cause a lot of times with business continuity, people think only ransomware and then they think only I have backups, you know, off site and get out of my face, Kevin, like, Ugh, like I'm just restored from backups next. But in reality, you got to think of all the data, including data that's served up in the cloud. All right, guys, uh, really quickly. Um, couple things before we get out of here. Um, this Thursday at 4.30 p.m., we are welcoming Gary Binder. You may remember Gary. He came on a few months ago to talk about Intel, but this guy is next level smart on quantum cryptography and encryption. We're just going to have a casual talk. He sent me a slide deck with 19 slides. This guy is an intellectual. He's an academic. He's going to be bringing the heat. If you have any questions at all about encryption or cryptography or Q-Day or quantum or Kraken AES or whatever, bring them because this guy, he his brain is like, I'm surprised, like with all due respect, I'm surprised his head isn't like, looks like Megamind or something because he is so smart. It's crazy. I also want to let everybody know we're, we're doing it again with Lima Charlie this year. Cybersecurity cares. Guys, last year, if you were around in the Simply Cyber community, you might remember I uh, Simply Cyber partnered with uh, Lima Charlie um, to drive uh, uh, fundraising and awareness to domestic violence. Guys, one in three women are victims of domestic violence. Guys, one in four men are victims of domestic violence. Okay. Uh, this is a great initiative. You can see all the companies that are involved. Lima Charlie, obviously. Cetaria, local to Charleston. Look at this. Simply Cyber's in the house. Very proud to be part of it. Uh, cybersecurity cares. They start their campaign today on December 15th. I think I will be doing a live stream with Lima Charlie and cybersecurity cares to further raise awareness. I just want to make everybody aware again. I'll drop the link in chat, um, and let everyone know. All right, guys, I hope you got value. It is the final week of Citadel. All right. Uh, today, Thursday, and then next Tuesday, I'm going to do a remote class. But we are getting close to the end of the fall 2023 season, which basically just means more jaw jacking on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Guys, I got to boogie out of here and get to class. Happy holidays for all those who like seeds in their fruit. You know, agree to disagree. I'm Jerry from Simply Cyber, your chat. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, mods. Look forward to the post on Simply Cyber Community Challenge. I'll see you guys tomorrow at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. Holla!
Everybody, I hope you enjoyed that content. Keep the cybersecurity train going by connecting with the other Simply Cyber community resources. We have the Discord server that's lively and always keeps the conversation going. You can connect with me directly on LinkedIn. And also every single weekday morning on the Simply Cyber channel, we're doing live daily cyber threat briefings, 8 a.m. Eastern time, as well as Thursday at 4.30 p.m. We're doing live stream interviews with industry experts and we produce videos that we push out every Wednesday morning. I'm Jerry from Simply Cyber. I hope you enjoyed the content and we'll see you in the next one.